Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's session on exploring Zoom. We will be exploring features of Zoom that we use to conduct online sessions, such as breakout rooms, polls, uh, how to make hosts and co-hosts, how to share screens, what are the different views, etc. So let's get technical. So here are some of the things that we will be seeing in today's session. So a few things to keep in mind as a facilitator. So when you are conducting an online session um, and you are the facilitator of the session, there are a few things you need to keep in mind to be a good facilitator and make sure that your audience or the participants have a good experience. Uh, next, we'll have a look at how to log into Zoom. There are a couple of different ways to do that, and we're going to have a look at what those different options are. Uh, we're going to learn how to sign in and schedule a meeting. We're going to have a look at the basic meeting settings that you should know, um, you know, before the meeting even starts, something that you need to keep in mind. What are the duties or the role of a co-host or a co-facilitator? And here I might be using the terms interchangeably because co-host, usually we make people co-host when we need them to co-facilitate with us. Um, however, we'll get into the details of it in a bit. What is the difference between a host and a co-host in a Zoom meeting? Breakout rooms, polls, and how to communicate with a co-facilitator. Because when the session's going on, when you're already conducting and facilitating an exercise or an activity, uh, there are times when you need to talk to your co-facilitator and inform them about something that you're changing or just check in with them about something. So what are the different ways we could possibly do that? So this is something that I'm going to take you through today. So let's head on to few tips to keep in mind as a facilitator. The first thing is improve your typing. So um, there are times when we take down the sharings of our participants. So if they are talking to us or sharing their experiences and just, you know, maybe replying to our questions, and we want to note down the key points, um, we type them down either on whiteboard or on our empty PPT screen that we're sharing with them either during our note taking or after. Uh, well, anyway, they'll be talking and sharing the experience. And so we need to really be able to type in a smart and fast way. Do not bother typing the entire sentence that the person is speaking because we just can't keep up and it's unnecessary. But focus on the keywords that they're saying, maybe the words uh, that could be values or qualities or just things that when you just read the keywords, you'll kind of remember the gist of the whole thing. So improve your typing. Next is be familiar with the interface. You should know if you are conducting a session on Zoom, you need to know where the chat box is, where the participant panel is, how to mute and unmute, and other settings that will help you ensure a smooth running of your session. Third is you should know the basic functioning of PowerPoint. Uh, if you're going to be using PPTs to you know, display our questions or just an introductory mode of explaining to the participants what the session is about. To any extent, if we are using PPTs, we need to know the basic functioning of it. Like, how do I put it on full screen? Am I sharing it right? How do I make slides? How do I make notes? Uh, you know, how do I take notes on PPTs? So all that should be, you know, it's basic stuff. We're not going to look into basic functioning of PPT today. I'll leave that for another video some other time, but we should know it if we're going to be using it. And uh, the next one is co-host duties. Um, if you are the co-facilitator, then your job is to support the person who's facilitating the session. That means while somebody is explaining the activity, there might be background noises coming from the participants, for example. It is your job to go to the participant panel, see who's unmuted themselves unknowingly and 
you know, there's disturbance coming from there, mute them. Or if some participant has posted a question on chat, which you can answer, answer it, you know, just help the facilitator run the session smoothly. That is your duty as a co-facilitator. Now, as a facilitator, it is very, very important for you to log in from a system, be it a desktop or a laptop. Do not log in from your phone to conduct the session because all the options are not available on your phone um, and you will not be able to run the session very smoothly. So stress on laptop or desktop. You must have an eye on the participant panel at all times um, and also the chat box because there are times when certain participants maybe raise their hands or unmute themselves. And if we don't have an eye on it, uh, we miss it and then they just don't speak up and we lose an opportunity for participant, uh, participants to interact and um, you know share their viewpoints. Also, there are certain participants who are very shy, camera shy, and they're not comfortable unmuting themselves and talking in front of everybody. So those kind of people usually prefer the chat box. Uh, so keep an eye because you might miss out otherwise. And if you are explaining a session as a facilitator, maybe your co-facilitator could do these things. Keep everything ready and prepared, whether it's your PowerPoints, whether it's some music that you need to play or a video you need to show a little later on in the session. Don't wait, you know, to for the session to start and in the middle of the session to look for all these things that you need. Keep everything open and ready so that it's quick to use and you don't waste any time. Um, you must test everything before the session. Before the session starts, meet at least 15 minutes beforehand with your co-facilitators. Test out your tech because, I mean, tech is reliable only so much. Uh, we know we all have tech crashes. So we need to figure out, is the sound working properly? Is the video working fine? Is the PPT visible properly? How is the music volume? Because there are times when we take them through commentaries where you know, we need to also play some soft background music. Test it out. Is the music volume crashing or clashing with the voice of the person who's speaking? Do you need to increase or decrease the volume to maintain everything properly? Test all this out, even the lighting. If you are conducting a session, can the participants see you clearly? Is there enough light that is, you know, lighting up your face enough for people to be able to see you clearly? All these things are very important, They're very soft skill, basic things, but uh, they are important in conducting a good session. For online facilitation, you have to have a co-facilitator because technology is unreliable. And also there's a lot to do. Uh, like I said, you need to not only conduct the session, share PPT, share music, share videos, keep an eye on the participants, keep an eye on the chat box everything. Um, and so it's always good to have a co-facilitator. It is a must to have a co-facilitator. And additionally, you can also have a dedicated tech person in your session if you feel the requirement is there. Because after all, the reason we're doing this is for the participants to have a very good experience and a smooth running of your session will ensure that they have a good experience from your session. So now we'll get into the basics of Zoom, starting with how do you log into Zoom? So it's super uh, easy to start uh, Zoom. You can get a free account. Now, if you are conducting a session and the session is over 40 minutes, which usually it would be, um, it is recommended that you buy the Zoom account. I mean, you you know, get a paid version of Zoom because the free version only allows you to have a meeting for 40 minutes and then it just shuts. So you can't keep logging in again. And that again clashes with the good experience of the participants. But for your own personal requirements or to practice some of these features, you can sign up for a free session. Um, all you have to do is go to zoom.us or zoom.us and sign up 
or click on the button that says sign up, it's free. And then just log in with your email ID, put a password and you're ready to go. Now logging into Zoom when somebody sends you a meeting link. So for example, this is a snapshot from my WhatsApp. Somebody WhatsApped me a direct meeting link along with the meeting ID and password. Now, if I click on the direct link, I go directly into Zoom. However, if I log in from the Zoom app and I say join a meeting, then I have to put in the meeting ID as well as the password. Now, the benefit of the direct link is that the password is already embedded. If you see, it says PWD over here. So the password's already embedded into the direct link. So all you have to do is click on the direct link and it'll take you to the meeting. Um, again, password embedded in the direct link is a setting we will be looking at a little later on. You can choose to enable it or disable it in your meeting set account settings in Zoom, which we will come to in a bit. Now, if you're joining from your mobile, again, if you don't have a direct link, if you just have a meeting ID and password shared with you, then what you can do is go to your Zoom app on your phone, click on join a meeting, type in the meeting ID. Sometimes there's a password, type in the password and then you're into the Zoom meeting. Uh, of course, you'll have to join with the audio. So there are two options, call via device audio or dial in. Now, we usually use the data or Wi-Fi, so the device audio is what we use. Dial in is used more in bigger organizations or corporates when they have global meetings and conferences. Um, that's something we don't use, so I'm not going to get into the details of that. Just remember to use the call via device audio. Now to join from your desktop or your laptop, super simple again, um, just go to the Zoom app. Either you can download the app for, the, for your desktop or go to the browser, zoom.us on any browser that you use and then click on join a meeting. Uh, if you're not signed in, you can still join a meeting. Uh, you know, just type in your meeting ID, type in your name, uh, that you want people to see when you log in. A lot of times we recommend people use their full name along with their countries because we have global meetups, right? And so it's just clearer for everybody. Um, and yeah, if there is a password, type that in and you're ready to go. You're good to go. So this is how, um, you know, the screen appears. You can see the meeting topic. You can see the host who has invited you. You can see the password. You can see um, the invite link, the participant ID while you're still waiting for everybody to join. Um, usually the hosts join first and they already have a screen ready for before you begin. So you might not see the screen. Again, there's a join audio button on the bottom left. Uh, same options as before we will always join with computer audio. So the call me option is not something we use. Join with computer audio is what we use. So let's see how we can sign in and schedule a meeting on Zoom. I've recorded this bit, excuse my voice. Uh, we're just gonna jump into this video now. So this is our meetings panel. And we click on schedule a meeting to schedule a new meeting. We type in whatever topic that we want. We decide the date, when do we want it, what time do we want it, and for how long. Our time zone, everything can be changed. Now, there's also an option to make it a recurring meeting. That means, is it going to happen every week, every day, every month at a particular time? So it will automatically set up that meeting for you. So these are some of the functions for that. Next is the passcode. So you can choose whatever passcode you want for the meeting and you can choose whether you want waiting room or not. You can either automatically record meeting or you can just do it manually when you go. So that's how you do it. 
now if we don't do recurring meeting that's completely fine too now there's an option to make it a personal meeting id which is not required at this point we'll not go into that so we just have to type generate automatically and then save once we click on save we will get the meeting id the security which is passcode the invite link so you can just copy invitation and then um, copy and paste this invite to whatsapp or email or wherever however you want to send the details to whoever's going to attend the meeting for example here i'm just saving it on word to show you how you can just copy paste it okay and then you can edit the meeting settings so once you edit the meeting settings you can change a few things change the date change the time here we made it a recurring so now once it's a recurring meeting when i edit again they will ask me do you want to edit all meetings or only this one particular meeting on this particular day so again that's an option and you can choose so that's basically how you schedule a meeting Um, so that was just a quick video on how to schedule a meeting and the different meeting options that you'll see on the page. Now we go into meeting settings. There are quite a few. So I'm just gonna, you know, share my screen and show this to you live. Um, so I've got my Zoom open here. Okay. So this is the Zoom account that I've, I'm currently using. Uh, when you go into Zoom, I'll just show you how it goes. Even if you're signed in, this is the screen you'll be able to see. On your uh, right top right corner, you'll see something called My Account. Click on your account. Sorry. Once you click on your account, you will see your profile on the top right, okay, with maybe the first letter of your email ID or your name. Um, here it's B. And when you click on it and go into your profile, you'll see all your profile details. So it's Kosha Bhatia, which is my name, um, the location, the department. There's different um, details that you can add like phone, email, uh, you know, your language, your time zones, the date formats that you prefer. Now, um, there's something called personal meeting ID, which is every account has a personal meeting ID, which is a set thing, which is generic and it doesn't change. It's, it's a permanent meeting ID. So every time you need to have a quick meeting, instead of generating or scheduling a whole new meeting, you can always use these for quick referencing. So that's your permanent personal meeting ID. Now there's something called host key, which is very important. Okay, so um, the host key is something that you can edit as well. Um, and it's something that you can share with people. We will see more about the host key in a bit. So I'm not going to get into the details of it. But it is an important aspect and you can keep that in mind. License, if it's a free license, you'll see over here that it says free license. If you have a paid version, then it's going to show licensed. It is going to show what kind of a license you have. For example, the free version probably has 100 participants. This one's a slightly higher than the free version, which is 300 participants. Um, then you have your account number, you have your email IDs, you have your password that you can edit from here. You can have different sorts of things. Um, so yeah, this is your basic profile that you will be able to see when you sign into Zoom. If you have a free account, you will have all these things, but some of them will be uneditable. Now, the basic stuff that we get into is on the left-hand panel. So you see this panel right here. Um, there's meetings, there's webinars, there's personal contacts, there's whiteboards. 
recordings. So all the recorded um, Zoom sessions that you record on cloud will be saved here. Then there's meeting summary, settings, scheduler, account profile. So what we're going to look into now is the settings panel. So I click on the settings and there are so many. So we're just going to take them step by step. So when we start uh, right from the top, there's security. So um, now for security, if you want really tight security on all your meetings, it is you can turn this on so you can toggle it on or off. I prefer to keep it off because I feel like I don't need double security. What that means is either you have to have a password or a passcode to get into each meeting or you by default, everyone will automatically be automatically always be put in a waiting room. And as a host, only after you sign in and you admit everyone, can you proceed with your session. I find both of these tiresome and unnecessary, so I have toggled it off. It is completely up to you. Again, enabling waiting room. Do you want to have a waiting room or do you not? Um, this setting can also be um, made per meeting. So some meetings I have waiting rooms, some I do not. So I keep it off. And then depending on my requirements, I turn it on and off from another setting, uh, which you saw in the meetings. When you're scheduling a meeting, you get that, get this option as well. So if that's when you want to turn it on, that's okay. So I've kept it off. Um, so yes, that's require passcode when scheduling new meetings. I have turned it off. And again, I would prefer this option when I'm in my meeting, scheduling a new meeting. If I turn it on here, every meeting will compulsorily have a passcode and I do not want that. Require a passcode, so we're not even gonna look at that. Um, require a passcode for personal meetings. I think this is by default. So um, you, it just happens. So there are a lot of them that are not required. So I'm going to skip through the ones that we really don't need to rack our brains with right now. Require passcode for participants joining by phone. Again, not required. Let people choose whether they want to join by phone or laptop. This is the one I was talking about. Embed passcode in invite link for one click join. So if you're sending a direct link to somebody and if they click on the direct link, they can immediately automatically join the session without typing in the passcode. So this is the embedded link. I have turned it on because it's ease of use. Again, only authenticated meeting participants and webinar attendees can join. That's no not required because usually our workshops are open to everybody. So we don't need to authenticate who's coming, who's not. It's open for all. Um, if waiting room is enabled, okay, this is again not required. We don't need to worry about all these things. You can just skip through all of this. Schedule a meeting. Okay, something to keep in mind. These are some of the options that I usually turn off because what it says is start meetings with host video on. Now, as a host, I don't want to come into a meeting with the video already on and I'm still like setting things up and a little, you know, fumbling with my stuff. So I would rather join a meeting with my video off. When I'm ready, I can turn my video on. So I like to have that option. Similarly with participants, start meetings with participant videos on. Again, no, let people get comfortable. Let them choose when they want their video on. Um, audio type, we give options. I mean, we can just choose telephone and computer audio, though we always prefer computer audio and we don't have the scope for telephone. So it doesn't really matter. Allow participants to join before host. Uh, okay, this is an important one. I turn it on because there are certain meetings that I schedule for other people and I am not able to join those meetings. So, and those other people who I have scheduled meetings for do not have my Zoom account ID and password. 
So when I schedule meetings for them, they can just hop in, use the direct link or use the meeting ID and password and get into the Zoom account and use the Zoom um, session without being a host. That's one option. So they can get into that meeting. Second option is the host key that I showed you all earlier, and we'll come to this in a bit. So I'm not going to get into that, but allow participants to join before host. If you're planning to do it for somebody else, um, you know, schedule meetings for somebody else, or even if you're the host and sometimes you can't facilitate a meeting and somebody else is doing it on your behalf and you don't want to give them the account ID and password, it, just switch this on. Enable dedicated group chats, so forget that. Allow Zoom rooms to start with meeting host key. Again, this is something that we're going to talk about in a little bit. I have enabled it. Enable personal meeting ID, yes. Um, I mean, this is pers like this is up to you. It's not really a requirement for our need for what we're talking about today. Mute all participants when joining a meeting, yes. So this is very important because when you're in the middle of a session and some people join late, you don't want, you know, that noise to come indicating that a new participant has joined because that's disturbing to when you're conducting the session. So you want this to be turned on. Let them start with mute and then when the chance comes, they can unmute themselves. Um, upcoming meeting reminders, meeting templates, all this is, um, I'm not going to get into that. It's not required. Meeting chat. So when you are, when you have the chat box in your meeting, you have the option to choose whether the participants can chat or not at all, whether the participants can send chat messages to hosts and co-hosts only, or whether they can send messages and chats to everybody, um, you know, like where everyone can see the message, or whether they can send messages and chats to everyone or also to each other directly, privately. So these are all the options. You can always change them whenever. Or, or if you don't want the chat enabled at all, you can turn it off. But we highly recommend enabling the chat and allowing people to be free with it because that's one of the ways people are comfortable expressing themselves. So you can allow how much ever you want to according to your session needs. New meeting chat experience, allow participants to delete messages, sure. Enable screenshot feature. So allow people to share screenshots in the chat. Sure, why not? Um, allow participants to react to meeting chat messages. These are those emojis, you know, the heart, the thumbs up that people use these days. Um, again, up to you, but I would enable all these because it just adds that fun element and allows people to interact a little more. So these are direct messages, which you can turn on and off. Uh, I have turned, I've kept it on. Very important, meeting chat auto save. If you want to, um, if you want to save all the chat feedback that you get in your sessions on the online sessions that you conduct, turn this on. So in case you forget to record the meeting or you forget to, you know, save those chats manually, it will automatically save them for you and you will not lose valuable data. Um, a lot of different people use this account, so I am not turning on the auto save and I just have to remind myself to save what I need to at that time. Um, again, this is a very personal choice up to you depending on how you use your Zoom account. Sound notification when someone joins or leaves, always, always turn this off. Uh, there is another way to turn it on and off, but just it's so disturbing. So I would highly recommend you to turn it off. Send files via meeting chat. Sure, like you can send maybe screenshots of the whole group together, you know, like a group picture or something. So yeah, why not? Um, co-hosts. So if you turn this off, you cannot make co-hosts. So for you to have co-facilitators and co-hosts, you need to keep this on. There is an option for you to conduct polls and quizzes. 
uh, during your session online. So if you want those options, turn it on. Uh, meeting surveys. Allow hosts to present a survey to participants once the meeting has ended. A lot of sessions do use this, so you can keep it on. Show raised hand in toolbar. Um, this is if you want it on your toolbar. If you don't want it on your toolbar, you can still see it uh, in other places. You can turn this on. That's okay. Show Zoom windows during screen share like I'm doing right now. So if I turn this off, you will not be able to see the Zoom settings page that you can see right now. I have enabled it so I can do this tutorial for you. Screen sharing. Uh, yes, because sometimes we need to share our screens for the whiteboard, for the PPTs, or for videos that we want to show the participants. So yes, we need to enable screen share. How many participants can share screen at the same time? I highly recommend one participant at a time. We have tried in the past where we have enabled multiple people to share screens at once. And what happens is some participants can see one of the screens the other participants can see only the other uh, you know screen so not everyone can see the same thing at the same time and it's very confusing so i would recommend one participant sharing screen at a time who can share you can choose whether you want only hosts to share or whether you want to allow all participants to share their screens um and then sometimes it happens that somebody's sharing their screen and they're just not stopping the screen share on time and you're wasting valuable time. So if you want to override that and you want to share your screen on top of that and just shut their screen sharing, you can enable others to do so. So whether you want that power of overriding a screen share to have only the host to have it or other participants to be able to do that too is up to you. I choose host only. Uh, disable desktop sharing screen sharing for, okay, I don't need to disable my desktop screens or any other things. So I've not turned it on. Annotation, turn it off. Because what annotation means is when you are, when you have your screen sharing happening, people can draw on the screen. And we've had, in the very beginning when COVID started and we started using Zoom, maybe a lot of people didn't know about this feature or they were just on their phones, but they would scribble on screen and everyone could see that. And it is disturbing when you're conducting a session. So keep it off always. Whiteboard, um, again, this is one of the screens that Zoom allows you to particularly share, and you can see the whiteboard option on the left-hand side as well. Um, that's just a clean white space with some text and shape and other options. So when people are sharing their ideas and you want to make a note of everything in front of everyone all at once, you can share the whiteboard and you can take down the sharings or notes. Um, again, this is one way to do it. Another way to do it is just on an empty PPT screen. So up to you, your choice. But I would highly recommend playing around with all these features on Zoom, um, you know, with a free ID. Remote control. Um, you can turn it on or off. I've hardly, I don't think I've ever used this feature, but it just means that if my computer is stuck or if I want somebody else to control my screen, I can allow that to happen. Similarly with slide control, if I'm sharing my screen, but I want somebody else to change the slides remotely, they can. Meeting reactions. Um, so again, you choose what kind of reactions you want the people to have, and you can select them, or you can just allow them to share all sorts of emojis. Um, so I've kept all. Join different meetings simultaneously on desktop. Kept it on, but don't use much. Allow removed participants to rejoin. Now, this is something that's purely up to you. Now, there could be that you've accidentally removed a participant from a meeting and they can just click the link and join again. But this could work the other way, wherein there's a participant who is very disturbing and he's 
he or she is bringing the energy of the group down or it's just someone you don't need in your meeting and you purposely remove them, they can rejoin if this is on. So you really need to figure out what your requirement is and turn it on and off accordingly. Show invitee list in the participants panel. Um, sure, I mean, I don't think we use this much. Allow users to change their name when rejoining a meeting. Yes, please. Because a lot of times when participants join, um, sometimes by default, the name that they join with is their cell phone model name or something like Apple iPhone or something. And you don't really know who that person is unless they rename themselves. So allow people to rename themselves. Okay, um, again, similar options. Um, allow host or co-host to rename participants in the waiting room. Yes, because I don't think participants can change their own names in the waiting room unless they join the meeting. That was my experience last time. So I don't think it's possible. Um, hide participant profile pictures in a meeting. You can, because sometimes when people don't turn on the video, instead of a video by default, it is their profile picture. And sometimes the profile picture is not very professional. So it depends on you. Okay, so finally we've moved on to the advanced settings of the meetings. Uh, there are quite a few settings, so we're just going to go through all of them. Take your time, revisit this video when you need to, uh, because I know it's a lot to take in. So report to Zoom is just something internally for their back end to make sure the application is going fine. Q&A in meetings. So there'll be a separate box for people to type their questions in, and then you can answer them, and then they'll move on to the answered tab of that chat box. So this is something that's optional. Um, usually we just use a normal chat box, but no harm in turning it on. Breakout rooms, yes, very important because we use breakout rooms in our sessions to break into smaller groups to discuss further. So we use this feature a lot. Um, again, all these are just different aspects of breakout room. Assign participants to breakout rooms when scheduling, yes. Broadcast message to participants when they are in different breakout rooms, yes. Broadcast voice to breakout rooms, that's a relatively new feature, yes. Um, allow host to view activity statuses of participants in breakout rooms, like whether they are sharing reactions or sharing screens. And we'll come to breakout rooms a little later in this video, but yeah. I've turned everything on because we use most of it. Remote support, again, I don't think I've ever used this. Manual captions, there are some people from different parts of the world who might not understand your language very clearly, and they might need captions to understand you better. So I've just turned it on for their, um, you know, for them. So the automated captions are for them. Manual captions are when um, we have multi-language global sessions and there are actually translators who manually type things as the session's happening. Um, so I've just kept it on, but for our sessions, we don't really use those, but people have used that in the past and so I've kept it on. Full transcript, uh, again, this is something when you record a video and it gets saved, you will see a full transcript. Save captions, uh, this is something that's a new um, feature that Zoom has released, which is why I think it's offering a free trial of it. I don't think I need it. Uh, language interpretation, again, these are the default languages that Zoom provides translations in. Um, again, up to you, up to you. Well, this is not required. Virtual backgrounds, yes, we keep them on so that if you don't want to see what's actually behind me, I can put on a virtual background and you'll be able to see that instead. Immersive view, we don't really use, um, but you can turn it on and off. So I'm just going to skip through all of this because it's really not so required. 
show a join from browse from your browser link yes so that's again up to you you can show that allow live streaming of meetings yes um we probably don't need it for these sessions but if you want to use your zoom account to ever live stream uh, you know, if you have more than like, for, for example, this Zoom account allows 300 participants to join in at a time. And if I have more, like maybe if I have 500 or 600 participants that I'm expecting and it's just a lecture or something not very interactive, we live stream. So there are some people with us on Zoom and then we also live stream maybe on YouTube or something else or Facebook um, videos. And there are a couple of hundred people on that other platform watching because Zoom is at full capacity. And that has happened in the past for some sessions. And so we always allow and enable this feature. Um, enable stop incoming video feature, yes. That means that you can stop other co-hosts or participants as a host from sharing their video because sometimes people just turn on their video and they don't realize their video is on. And sometimes, you know, they're just busy with something else and you don't want that to be seen by everybody. So you can turn their video off because they don't realize it. So yes, all these are just other views. You can... Um, yeah, just go through it by yourself, but it's not so important. Okay, we finally reached the end of it. So this was all about meeting settings. I'm just going to share my screen again and we'll pick up where we left off. Okay, so I showed you all the meeting settings that are there. Now settings before the meeting, what you need to do is disable annotations. So we already saw the annotations that are there in the settings panel. But even if you're inside the meeting, for example, you're using somebody else's Zoom account and it's not configured the way you would configure it, uh, you have the option when you are the host or when you're controlling the meeting, you'll see this toolbar on top. When you click on the three dots, you'll see more options. And there you'll see this option for disable attendee annotations. And that's how people will stop drawing on your screen. Now, the next thing is, uh, as a host or someone who's conducting the session, you need to know that in the participants panel, you have all sorts of settings that are very, very helpful. When you go to the participants panel, you'll see these three dots. Click on the three dots and here, these are the shortcut uh, meeting controls. For example, if I want to mute participants upon entry and we saw the same feature in the Zoom settings, but we can also toggle it on and off from here during the session. So if I want to mute people upon entry and I highly recommend that, tick mark against it. When people join the meeting, if they join with their audio and video on, it can be a little disruptive, uh, especially if they have a lot of background noise and you're in the middle of explaining something, it can just be disturbing. So please tick mark yes on mute participants upon entry. Allow participants to unmute themselves. Sometimes I toggle this on and off during my sessions, depending on like if I'm explaining something and I don't want disturbance, I will not allow them to unmute themselves. So they can stay muted and just listen. And then when we're ready to take on sharing, I'll just tick mark this so then they can unmute themselves and share things. Allow participants to rename themselves. Yes, I've already covered this point earlier, but there is a... Um, setting over here as well. Play sound when someone joins or leaves, always keep it off because otherwise there'll be this annoying sound every time somebody joins the meeting or leaves the meeting. And because of tech issues, this that's always happening. And so you don't want that extra disturbance. Enable waiting room. Um, this is very helpful. For example, if I as a host join the meeting and then I want to do some tech checks and set up everything before I allow participants to join the session, I turn this on. So while I'm doing my tech checks and, you know, while I still have time before the meeting officially starts, uh, they can wait in the waiting room. And then when the time 
you know, when it's time for the meeting, I just remove the check mark and admit all and then everyone directly starts coming into the meeting. Lock meeting is a very interesting feature. We don't use this because due to tech issues, people keep dropping off and joining. Uh, but lock meeting basically means that after everyone that you were expecting has joined the meeting, if you lock the meeting, no other person can join in anymore. So even so, that's what lock the meeting is. Um, so these are the meeting settings that are very helpful in the participant panel. Now the chat box. So you'll see the chat box at the bottom or on the right hand side. And again, the chat box has these options that you can turn on and off. And we saw these options in the meeting settings, but they're also over here wherein you can allow participants to chat with nobody, everyone, host only, all that. Now, um, when you're sharing the screen, the meeting controls go up, otherwise they're at the bottom, um, but the same controls. So here you can have, if you click on the three dots, you'll see a lot of settings. Some of them that are important are chat, um, and that's also how you can access the chat box if it's not readily visible for you already. Um, a few other settings are record on this computer or record to cloud. Now, the difference between these is when you record to cloud, it will go and be saved in that space I showed you in your Zoom account. On the left hand side, there's a panel for recordings and that's where your record to cloud recordings are. If you record on this computer, that means it's going to be saved on your uh, laptop or desktop in the documents. Usually it goes into the documents panel, like it just opens a new folder called Zoom and that's where it is. Um, these are the two options. Just a little heads up about PPT. If you want to share your PowerPoint screen for full screen, you just click on this little symbol at the bottom. Sharing screen. Now there are a lot of different things that you can do with share screen. Uh, so when you click on, if you see right at the bottom of the screen, you can see this option called share screen. It's this little tiny window with an upward arrow. Click on that and this window will pop up where it'll show you all the things that you have open on your computer. For example, I have some folders open, some Chrome web browsers open. I have my snipping tool. I have my PowerPoints. Um, so I have all these things open. So Zoom asks you, what screen do you exactly want to share? Now it's very important for you to keep everything open that you need to share because you can't click on share screen and then go and look for your video. Music, whether you're going to be sharing a video, Always, always tick mark that share sound option that you see over there um, because otherwise your participants will not be able to hear even though you will be playing music from your system. So they, you will hear it, but they will not. Uh, so always share sound. And then you just click on the share button. So it's that simple. Um, now that was for the basic screens, right? Basic sharing. And here you can see that it's tick marked the share computer sound. Now, um, one other thing to remember is that the person sharing screen also shares sound. You can't have one person sharing screen and another person sharing sound. So only one person can share at a time. So whoever's going to be uh, responsible for sharing the screen, keep your music ready, keep everything ready because you're going to be handling that. Next is the advanced settings for screen share. Now, there could be times when you just want to share the sound, you just want to share music, but you don't want to share screen. So for those times, you go into share screen and you click on this, um, you know, button on top, which says advanced. There on the, the third option, music or computer sound only. If you click on that and then you start your music on your system, people will not be able to see anything. Um, I mean, they'll just see you, but they won't be able to see your screen, but they'll only be able to hear the sound that you're sharing. 
So these are some of the options. Um, I'll just quickly take you through the rest of them, though it's not required. The first one is PowerPoint as a virtual background. What happens is your screen becomes the PowerPoint and your face becomes tiny in a corner so they can see you speaking, but they can see the PowerPoint full screen. Portion of screen is you can choose how much of the screen you want people to be able to see. I already explained the third option. The fourth option is content from second camera. If you have a webcam or something like that. So all you have to do is click on advanced, click on any of these options and click share. So um, I get asked this a lot, especially people who are new at facilitating. They get very confused. They don't know where to look. They don't know how to keep an eye on the participants, how to keep an eye on the chat. And everything gets a little too much. And the reason I know uh, this is because I started using Zoom in 2020 during like peak COVID times. And since I've been using it for like three years now, maybe a little more than that, I have gotten the hang of the platform in a way that I can move things around quickly and keep an eye on everything. So what my screen looks like is this. I have the participants panel floating on the left. I have the chat on the right. I have either me sharing screen in the center or somebody else sharing screen, but I'm keeping an eye on everything. I have the participants videos on the top or bottom somewhere. I have the tools floating about. So I'm keeping an eye on everything. As a facilitator, you have a co-facilitator to help you with all of this. So it's okay. Don't get overwhelmed. But it will get easier with time, with practice. It surely did for me. Um, in the participants panel, you'll see that the hosts and co-hosts are always shown at the top. Okay, right at the top of the screen, you will see all the hosts and co-hosts. I mean, there can only be one host, but you will see all the co-hosts up there. Um, then you will see things alphabetically unless somebody unmutes themselves. Then that person will come right below the co-hosts and you will see that they have unmuted themselves. That's how you keep an eye on who is unmuting themselves. So that's a little trick. Same thing happens with people raising their hands. Now, next is controlling participants. And by that, I mean, how do you keep your meetings going smooth? Um, number one, like I said, you can forcefully stop somebody's video. All you have to do is go in the participants panel where their name is, and you will see some options come up next to it. Just say stop video. Or if the video is on and you see it on the top or the bottom or on the sides, wherever your video panels are, you can just click on the three dots that appear when you hover over the video and you can click on stop video. You can rename the participant in the same way. You can pin their video so it's on a larger screen for you. And you can spotlight for everyone so that everyone can see that person as priority. I mean, that's the screen that will come in front of everybody. So when the, when somebody's speaking or explaining, we always spotlight the speaker's video. So it's in front of everybody and people can see who's talking. Um, you can make more than one person spotlight. So you can add spotlights uh, to somebody's already spotlighted video and you can go on and on adding spotlights. So those are the main videos that people will be able to see together. Um, you can make somebody host. This is an option you will see as well. Uh, but if you make somebody host, you will lose the host status. So only host can make somebody host or co-host. Uh, but there can be only one host. So if I make somebody a host, I am not a host anymore. So that's something to keep in mind. You can remove people from meetings or even if they've joined the meeting already, you can put them in the waiting room again. That's an option. Uh, again, all these meetings can be controlled from the participants panel. If you hover over somebody's name, you will see these options. When you see the more options, that's where you'll see all these options that we spoke about right now. If you are a participant and you want to raise your hand, 
go to the participant panel and you'll see this button to raise your hand. That's where you can just virtually raise your hand. Okay, so now we come to claim host. Now let's just assume hypothetically that I have scheduled a meeting for somebody else to conduct a session. Um, and I being the Zoom account holder, I'm not available on that day. So I won't be attending the meeting. I won't be conducting the session, but I've, I've scheduled a meeting for somebody else to conduct it. So um, I have allowed and enabled participants to join before host. And I'm not going to give that person my account, password, and you know, ID and password, because that's just something I'm not comfortable with. Or maybe it's not mine to give in the first place. It's a team thing. Um, so in that case, what we can do is we can enable participants to join before host. And remember that host key that we saw in the profile of the Zoom account holder. So you note down that host key and you share that host key with this friend of yours who's going to be conducting the session. So when that friend enters the meeting, they will not be a host, they'll just be any other participant. Then they will see this button on the participants panel at the bottom called claim host. They can click on that claim host a button, put in the host key that you've given them, and then they become a host. And then they can use all the features and all the meeting settings as a host. So that is one way that you can become a host of a meeting. So that is how the host key works. Another way to become a host is if the host makes you a host. So if, if I'm a host and I click on your name and I say make host, then you will become the host and I will not be host anymore. That's another way to make somebody a host. And as a host, and the third way is just sign in from your own account and be the host. Um, now hosts can make co-hosts. Only the host can make co-hosts. And you can make as many co-hosts as you need, 10, 15, 2, whatever. Um, but remember to enable that from your meeting settings, which we saw earlier. So that's Again, to make a co-host, all you have to do is go to that person's name on the participant panel, go to the more options, and you will see the option called make co-host. So that's what you click on. So now we will have a look at some of the co-host duties. Basically, there's no limit to how many co-hosts can be there in a meeting, but there can be only one host, but many co-hosts. Um, what the job of the co-host or co-facilitator is, is to help make the session run smoothly, help the facilitator when they're explaining, when they're talking. So tasks like answering participants' questions on chat or when someone raises their hand virtually and their question or their doubt is being answered, or they are sharing, lower their hand uh, so that you know that that person's gotten a chance. Noting down how many participants are there on the session, or even if it's a live stream session, how many participants are there watching the live stream. If you feel like somebody's audio is on accidentally and you can hear a lot of background noise, which is disturbing the session, mute them. Uh, again, stop their videos if you feel like some of some participants have turned on the video accidentally or it's disturbing. If you feel like the facilitator has forgotten something, forgotten to mention something, or if they feel like they're sharing their screen, but actually you, y'all, other people cannot see the screen. It is the job of the co-facilitator to interrupt the facilitator or the host or the anchor and just point out things that the facilitator might have missed. Like, you know, in case you're sharing your slide, we cannot see it or we can't hear you. Can you please check from your end? Just things like that to make sure that all the participants are having a good experience and that the facilitator isn't missing out on anything. So the co-facilitator also needs to know all the meeting settings and how and when to use them. 
Um, also, maybe when the facilitator is taking notes or taking that, I mean, sorry, when the facilitator is taking sharings from the participants, the co-facilitator takes down the notes so that the job is equally divided because it's difficult to interact with the participants as well as type something that's very disturbing um, and distracting. So it's better if the jobs are split between both of them. All this, who does what, what are everyone's jobs, all this needs to be decided beforehand, before the meeting even starts. So you have to plan all this well in advance. Um, now, see, tech issues is something that we all face all the time. So there could be times when the facilitator in, in the middle of an activity, the internet just conks off and they're gone from the meeting. It is the duty of the co-facilitator to step in and continue the session, take the session or the exercise forward, which is why all the exercises need to be thoroughly practiced by both facilitator and co-facilitator. You should be ready as a co-facilitator to step in when you're required to do so. You all should have good coordination with each other. And just a small tip, if you are a co-facilitator, you can just type a hashtag before your name because that way in the participant panel, your name will appear right on top and it will be easy for the host to make you a co-host. So those are some of the tips that you can remember as a co-facilitator or a co-host. Now, what is the difference between a host and a co-host? So number one, host is like the topmost, then comes the co-host. The host has all the functions. They can make other people co-hosts. Uh, so that's the major difference. Only hosts can make co-hosts. And there can be only one host. Host has all the meeting settings at their fingertips. Um, now, earlier it used to be that the poll and breakout room feature was only accessed by host, but now co-hosts can make breakout rooms as well. So that is a change that Zoom has come up with. Just a quick reminder on how you can be a host. Number one, if it is your account ID and password and you sign in, you can automatically become a host. Number two, using the host key, uh, which we already spoke about a little earlier in this video. And number three, if somebody makes you a host. Now, there are a couple of different ways you can view your screen, whether as a participant or as a host co-host. Uh, if you're a co-host co or a host and you make these changes, they will reflect for everybody. But if you're a participant, you can make these changes for your viewing. For example, if you want to look at the speaker, click on the speaker and you'll see the speaker bigger and everyone else smaller. If you want to see everyone together on the screen, as many as possible, click on gallery and you'll see everyone's videos next to each other in a wonderful gallery of participants. Um, immersive is again something for hosts and co-hosts. We don't use this feature, but I'll just tell you what it is. Um, it is one big background and everyone who starts their videos is shown in the same background, like, for example, in a classroom. So you have a background of a classroom and everyone who starts their videos will be like tiny people on the chairs in that one background. Uh, so that's what immersive is. We don't use that. Um, the rest of the features are self-explanatory. Now, there's something that I would highly rec recommend is to explore the audio and video settings that Zoom has, uh, which are right at the bottom where you see the mute or the join audio button and the vid stop and start video button. Uh, that's where if you see there's a tiny arrow pointing upwards, click on that arrow to see a lot of other settings. Now, when you click on the audio tiny arrow, you'll see something called audio settings. Once you click on that, you can explore various things like what kind of a mic are you using to talk? Um, you know, what is the volume of that? There's also now amazing uh, settings where they can adjust your microphone volume automatically. They can even suppress background noise. Um, so that's very, very helpful. And in video settings also, you'll see many, many settings like 
add a video filter or you know make your video brighter so adjust for lighting or backgrounds and filters blur your background add a virtual background so many options so i recommend that you play around with those settings explore it more and yeah have a better experience with zoom okay so for breakout rooms uh this is interesting there's a lot of different updates coming up in zoom all the time so i'll tell you about my experiences so far so with breakout rooms, you'll see that there's a button. Only hosts and co-hosts can see all these settings. So, you know, I recommend getting that free ID so you can play around with these a little bit. When you click on breakout rooms, I'll tell you what they're for firstly. For example, there are 50 people in your meeting and you want to do an activity where people break out into pairs or groups of three or five people so you'll have 10 groups with five people each and that's how you'll divide the 50 people now they'll go into these tinier groups for an amount of time that you decide and you can tell them what to discuss amongst themselves and this is usually enjoyed by people uh, because they love the one-on-one -on -one interaction or interacting in smaller groups where everyone has a chance to share and speak and, you know, at a more personal level. So that's what breakout rooms are used for primarily. Um, once you click on it, you can figure out a lot of different settings. For example, you can automatically assign participants into how many other rooms you want. For, for example, if there are 50 participants, do you want, um, you know, them to be in two, sorry, do you want the 50 participants to be bifurcated or automatically assigned randomly into, say, 10 rooms, so five people each, or do you want to automatically assign 50 people into 25 rooms? So two people each. So you decide how many rooms. You decide whether you want to do it automatically for a quick turnover and they will just do that for you. But if you want to decide who goes into what room and to make sure that the co-hosts don't just go into the rooms as well randomly, then you click on the manual option and manually you can create how many ever rooms you want you can rename the rooms you can move people about until you open the rooms while you're still setting it up you can have all these options so you can keep adding rooms as and when required and you can assign participants to different different rooms so this is something that uh, the manual distribution allows you to do uh, sometimes we rename our rooms like flying angels or compassionate carers or something like that. Uh, and that's an option. You can rename the rooms. So that's something to look to. Like I said, you can move people from one room to another uh, while you're still setting it up. You can exchange one person to the other from one room to another. Um, adding a room gives you an option to add more rooms. And recreate is like a reset button. So all of this goes away and you can start from scratch to assign people to different rooms. Open all rooms starts breakout rooms. Once the breakout rooms have started, you cannot make any of these changes. So make very, very sure what you're doing, how you're doing it. What are your settings before you start the rooms? Now, before you start the rooms, there's one more thing that you need to look into, which is um, the options part of it, which we're going to come to in a bit. And now, before we come into that, I just want to say that hosts and co-hosts can jump between rooms. Uh, for example, if I'm a co-host, I want to make sure that room one knows what they're supposed to do, that they've all started their audios, videos, and that they are interacting with each other and that they're not confused about it. So I'll just pop in there as a co-host, make sure everything's running smooth, interact with them, get them started, and then move on to another room and check in on them. So as a host or a co-host, I can jump between rooms. Uh, I will see the join button. And then I can just click on it and join the room. So that's how, as co-hosts, we can do that. 
Now, uh, another amazing feature that Zoom has added is you can add broadcast messages which go into all the rooms at once for example if you want to tell them look we're wrapping up in one minute so hurry up and wrap up your conversations because the rooms are going to close in a minute so you can message this and everyone will get this message on the top of their rooms and they can have a look at it uh, so another new feature that Zoom has added is broadcast voice to messages and we saw these features in the meeting settings uh, a little while ago so in that case, instead of typing a message, you can record the message in your voice and send it to all the rooms. It's basically the same thing. The only thing is this is a written message and that's a voice recorded message. Um, okay, so the options is coming in a bit. Now, in the options setting, you will get to choose a lot of different um, options of how the breakout room runs and ends. But usually after the breakout room, after you close all the rooms, sometimes, and you can set this timer, you get 60 seconds or 30 seconds timer, allowing people to wrap up their conversations and come back to the main session automatically. So depending on how much time you have set, you will see that timer at the bottom of the breakout rooms, um, you know, counting down. Now, if you see on the extreme left, there is something called options. No. You have the option to open the same rooms again. So once you've finished your breakout rooms and everyone has come back, if you want to send them to the very same rooms in the same order, you all you have to do is click on open all rooms and people will go back into the same breakout rooms. So that's an option to keep in mind. Now, before you open all the rooms, while you're still setting up your breakout rooms, um, I would recommend checking out the options section, which is on the left at the bottom. Number one, the option to move all participants into breakout rooms automatically. I highly recommend that because in our experience, there have been times where we've started the rooms and then people get a pop up saying join room and they just don't click on it and they don't join the room and the time is going by and the participants are not in their rooms yet. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing and it gets very confusing. So I would recommend that you mark move all part participants into breakout rooms automatically so that they don't have a choice in the matter. They just automatically go into the rooms and it saves time. Now, the second option is allow participants to return to the main session at any time. Um, I don't check mark that because they don't need to come back in the main session at any time. It's better that they come back at the end of their breakout rooms, which is usually for 10, 15 minutes, or depending on how much of a time you, the exercise needs, which you can also set in option number three. Breakout rooms close automatically after, and then you can add how many minutes. Do you want the breakout room going on for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20, 25, 30 any number, just put the number of minutes and that's how long the breakout room will go on for. Then there's something called countdown after closing breakout room, which is what we saw in the earlier slide, wherein after, after the 10 minutes are over, they get a buffer of 30 seconds or 60 seconds. You get to choose the seconds. And after the 10 minutes are over, they have like a warning of 30 seconds or 60 seconds to wrap up everything. And then they'll automatically be brought back into the main session. So those are the sessions for the breakout room. This is a slide that we usually show uh, to our participants before sending them into breakout rooms because they need to understand what is happening to them. You can't suddenly in the middle of an activity just send them into a breakout room and they'll be like, what happened? Did the meeting get over? Because they are not used to Zoom like we are. And sometimes some people might be experiencing breakout room for the first time and we don't want to catch them off guard. So we give them the directions of how to join a breakout room. For example, if 
not automatically directed. There is a pop-out window that will come in front of the screen saying join breakout room and then they click on it to join the rooms that they have been assigned. If you click on ask for help and there will be a ask for help button uh, at the top of everyone's rooms. So all participants can just click on that ask for help button if they feel stuck and then the host or co-host can go to their rooms and answer their questions. The name of the breakout room appears on top and you can just inform them that at the end you will have a 60 second countdown and you will come back automatically. So once the participant knows what's happening to them, it's just it's just better for them. Uh, one more thing that I wanted to talk to you all about is this new feature of breakout rooms that Zoom has come up with, which is allow participants to choose their rooms. We do not recommend that, uh, but I'm just telling you that option is now there. It's a new feature uh, where you can allow participants to choose which room they want to go to. Don't allow that. <laughs> um, so then we come towards the end of our session, which is polls. How do you start, you know, how do you show a poll to the participants and let them interact with it a little bit? When you are scheduling a meeting, right at the bottom, there is something called poll. And you can add polls, you can edit polls. And when you go into the poll, you have like this questionnaire that you set for the participants. You can add your questions. You can allow the answers to be single choice or multiple choice. Uh, we ask questions like, what did you know? Did you find the session helpful? Would you want to attend more of these kind of sessions with yes, no, maybe answers, something like that. So, um, you know, whatever goals you create, you can create way beforehand while you're scheduling the meeting and just keep it there along with the meeting. Then when your session is actually happening, you will see that there's a polling or a polls, um, a polls icon at the bottom of your controls. When you click on it, all the polls related that you've already saved earlier for this meeting will show up and you can have multiple polls. Um, then you click on the one that you want to start and it just starts and appears and opens in front of you. Go through it, edit it if you want. If you're happy with it, click on the launch poll button. When you launch the poll, that's when it's going to open up for all your participants and they can just answer the questions. And as and when they're answering and submitting their polls, live status of how much of the, how many participants participated and what the questions and answers were will appear in front of you, in front of the hosts and co-hosts. They can see how many people have uh, participated, what are the answers, all of that they can see. And then once you feel like enough people have voted or you give them like five minutes to answer these and once your five minutes are up or you feel like all 100% or even 80% have answered and you're okay with that, you can just click on end poll. So that's how you will, you can see that the poll has ended. And if you want to share the results of the poll with the participants, you click on share results. So even the participants will see what was the most voted item. What did everybody else think as well? Um, so that's how polls works. So yeah, before we end our meeting, I want to tell you how to end a meeting properly. Usually when we're going to be using our Zoom accounts, we will be using it with our team members. Um, so multiple people will be using these uh, Zoom accounts and meetings. If you do not end the meeting correctly, the other person who has logged in will think that the meeting is still on. And that's just not correct behavior. It's not etiquette for using Zoom, not the correct etiquette. So you will see as a host or a co-host, an end button at the bottom of your meeting uh, on the right hand side. When you click on the end button, you will see two options. 
One is to end meeting for all. And the second one will be leave the meeting. If you leave the meeting, the meeting still goes on without you. And if you end meeting for all, Zoom meeting just shuts, closes, and everyone's kicked out, sort of. Like, it just closes. So depending on what your requirement is, you need to use these controls properly. Uh, if you are done with the meeting, if your session is over, please do not just leave the meeting, but rather end meeting for all. How do you communicate with a co-facilitator while your session is going on? Now, there are two ways to do this. One is on private chat on Zoom. So we saw that the chat boxes allow us a couple of different options. But one of the options is to directly message another participant or another person in the meeting. As a host or a co-host, I might want to just message privately with my other co-facilitator. However, one down point of this, one downside of this feature is that during the session, a lot of participants will also be using the ch chat box. And so your chats might get lost in all the clutter when a lot of people are sharing stuff on chat. And so it's difficult to keep track um, and it's just time consuming. Another method of doing it is WhatsApp web. So there's a way where you can get your WhatsApp chat on your computer screen. It's called WhatsApp web. Um, it's very simple. You can just follow the WhatsApp web instructions and it just takes like two minutes. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can, that's another way through WhatsApp that you can keep in touch with your co-facilitator. Um, make sure that your WhatsApp web screen doesn't accidentally come up in front of the participants when you're sharing screen. But if you choose particularly which screen to share, this should not be an issue. So you should be okay. If you have any questions, please comment or write them down and I'll try and answer them to the best of my ability. I hope this was a good session for you and that you learned something from it. Uh, please do let me know. Thank you so much.